we continue the discussion with entrepreneurship and innovation, especially specifically technical innovation. Um, as you know, Met College couldn't exist if we do not continually innovate and be entrepreneurial because we serve working professionals. So we have to know the industry. And we are a college of Boston University, so we have to be academically rigorous. Now that is, of course, very difficult. But, um, and this is why it is so important and we are um, very privileged to hear today from leading academics and um, business leaders uh, about innovation. I will let them tell you much in more detail what they do and we'll just make quick introduction. Um, on my left is Tarun Kana. He is the Jorge Paulo uh, Lehman Professor at Harvard Business School. He's also the director of Harvard's, uh, Harvard South Asian Institute. And uh, when I looked at the page and saw the research, the, the, re late, the recent research is about, well, how do, um, how, how does uh, the best business experience travel across borders? And the answer, um, which is paradoxical at first, is basically it doesn't, because there are so many differences, and differences matter. And this is one of these insights which, at first, you don't believe them, and then you think about it, and actually, um, yes, it is obvious. How didn't anybody else find that out? Um, but that happens very, very rarely. Um, next is Ganapati Venugopal. He is the chief executive officer of Axilo Venture, and is going to share with us how one really can do that by looking at the context of the country. Um, then Shivan O'Mahony is, um, um, uh, is the chair of Strategy and Innovation Department at Boston University Questrom School of Business. And a central theme of her research is the role of communities and how they increasingly take precedence over formal organization. And last but not least is um, uh, Hrisantos de la Rocas, a professor info of information system at Boston University, Questrom School of Business. And he is also the director of Boston University Digital Learning Initiative. Um, his recent work has focused on business model innovation. And that innovation that is uh, made possible uh, through the new social and business functionalities of the internet. Um, so with much ado, I will uh, turn it over to our panelists. Uh, once again, the mic is uh, on your right. Please uh, prepare your question and just walk through the mic. Thank you, Tarun, could I? Thank you. Um, uh, good evening, or should I speak, is that better? Or? Is this working? Yeah, it's fine, okay. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, thank you so much. My name is Tarun. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here, and congratulations on your uh, 50th. Um, and it's very nice to be here with um, uh, Shibu and Kumari and uh, all our other friends and, and new friends that we're making. Um, I'm, um, um, I'm an applied mathematician, and I've uh, been living in a business school uh, down the road. Uh, for many years, and um, mostly interested in entrepreneurship in developing countries, um, like Shibu, and I'm from India, and grew up in India. And the, the, the question that I've been concerned with, at least for the last decade, uh, both as an academic and as an uh, entrepreneur myself, is, um, is an abstract one uh, that was just mentioned, which is, uh, how do good ideas travel? And I remember sitting in the MBA classroom at Harvard many years ago and um, uh, reflecting that some of the things that our professors were telling us didn't strike me as things that would particularly work well in my father's businesses in Bangalore. 
which were small manufacturing shops, and a number of uh, uh, quote-unquote truths that were being offered uh, to the class um, were well-intentioned and made sense uh, at an abstract level, but the particular implementation of the abstract principle made no sense at all, and there was no way, not a snowball's chance in hell, that those would uh, travel over to the Bangalore of the 1970s and 1980s that Shiva was talking about. Um, and in, in a sense, that's the motivation for a lot of my work, is to try to draw a distinction between uh, an abstract idea that sounds obvious uh, and the particular implementation of that abstract idea that I often find uh, people underestimate in how difficult it is to take that from one location to another. Uh, last year, I wrote an article called Contextual Intelligence, uh, where the idea was to present some very broad statistical data that uh, put some, a, a little bit of rigor around this notion that I, that I just suggested. Um, and a way, a way to communicate the content of that, that insight, which is true in a statistical sense, obviously there are counterexamples, but in a, st in a statistical sense it remains robustly true. Uh, the way to communicate that is to, um, it, it, is, is, is the following. In classes with executives I often ask, um, uh, if you were to take um, all the industries in a particular country, right? So think about a country, favorite country of yours, maybe it's, I don't know, Belgium, and you think about all the industries in there, beverages, um, uh, movies, uh, physical fitness studios, etc. Think about another country, Thailand, and rank the industries again in some order of attractiveness, really nice to work in, very profitable all the way down, and do the same in different countries. And then you ask yourself, that those rankings of attractiveness, however you measure them, um, how correlated are they gonna be on average, right? Um, so is the, is the question clear? I'm gonna pose it to you. Um, I just rank the industries, and I rank them in pairs of countries, and I consider all possible pairs that are possible in the world. There are 190 plus countries or 200 odd countries. I consider all possible pairs of countries. What would be the average pairwise correlation? Anybody wanna shout out? In other words, if it's very positive, it means that industries that are very attractive in one place will also be attractive somewhere else. Um, if it's negative, uh, well, I wouldn't know how to interpret that. It would be industries that are very attractive in one place tend not to be attractive somewhere else on average. Uh, and a zero is there's no pattern in the data. Sorry? Uh, the correlations are between plus and minus one. So you, you mean it's point? High positive. Okay, so very positively correlated. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So when you run this simple statistical exercise, which is reported in some academic work that I've been doing, uh, the answer is zero. Right? In other words, what that really says is that uh, on average, uh, information about how well a, an industry uh, behaves in one location tells you exactly nothing about how you would do on average in another location. Um, now that's, uh, that's another way of saying that, look, on the one hand, you know, running a cement plant is running a cement plant. The technology of making a cement plant hasn't changed in 100 years. It's got clinker and this and that, and you swirl it around, you do things with it, you add some limestone, et cetera. And that technology transfers perfectly. But, but the way in which the cement actually gets delivered to market and used to ultimately build buildings and houses and so on, uh, the people who get involved in making the cement, whether the workforce is unionized or not, whether the cement is sold in single bags or to institutional buyers, the financing of the sale of the cement, there are so many, many a slip tricks the cup and the lip, right? There are many different things that can happen between the time the cement is produced. So there's one thing, the technology may be the same, but the institutional milieu through which the technology has to navigate before it gets utilized goes through a bunch of different things that are quite different from location to location. Um, and it turns out that when you look at the data, uh, the abstract idea that you wanna make cement and you wanna make it in a nice factory with good values and with good teamwork, those ideas all transfer. Those are intuitive, um, but the way you implement them on the ground is actually quite different. So that's, the, that, that's an academic insight backed up by, I don't know, tens of thousands of points of data in some ways. Um, and let me connect that to the project that Shibu and Ganpati and I are involved in right now, which is to build this incubator, Axelor, 
which is only a year old, um, uh, if that. Um, and really what we're concerned with is to, is to create a, um, uh, a forum in, in Bangalore where interesting ideas that can address uh, huge problems in developing countries in India um, can, well, be incubated, can find an environment within which good, interesting uh, young folks can come together and work with each other and uh, raise the odds that they would succeed, uh, not just in the, the generation and gestation of the idea, but in its, in its actual implementation. And, of course, the central issue that you confront is um, uh, where, do, where do these ideas come from? Right? Uh, should, we, should we be borrowing ideas from other parts of the world? There's a very interesting firm that's done extraordinarily well, uh, run by two German brothers, right? Rocket. Uh, Rocket, I don't know if any of you heard, has anybody heard of Rocket? Rocket is a fund that is created in Germany. It's worth a couple of billion dollars. And these two German, German brothers, uh, you're from Dresden, right? No. No, or you I studied, studied in Dresden. In Dresden so these, yes. two, these two kids are from Dresden, um, <laughs> and um, all they've been doing is, you know, looking at ideas in different parts of the world and saying, "Oh, let's take that one and copy it. Oh, let's take that one and copy it." Um, and you know, it kind of works, uh, more or less. But I don't think that's a robust way. I don't think that's a way that is sustainable or that would address most of the interesting issues that we find in our particular milieu in Bangalore and in India and so on. So, uh, you know, the academic work is about the generation of ideas, whether ideas transfer. Um, and I have a, um, when you move beyond the obvious, of course, at the very, very abstract level, everything transfers. If we all say that we want to work for good companies with good values, that transfers. If we all say that we want to work in good teams, of course that transfers. How would you not want to work in a good team? Um, but how do you actually, or if you want to motivate employees, of course that transfers. You want to motivate employees. How could you not want to motivate an employee? But how do you actually do it? Do you use stock options? Um, do, you, um, do you work in teams? Or are you more in a communitarian setting, or an individualistic setting? Um, are you allowed to fire people? Is there arbitration in motivating in, in, in a dispute resolution situation? There's so many things that slip up. Um, that's where the variation comes. And in a practical sense, all of us are struggling with, um, happily struggling with. It's a, it's a really fun project that we've undertaken to try to figure out how to make it work at scale and uh, really launch uh, dozens of enterprises as opposed to doing them one or two at a time. Um, so I'll, I'll stop with those, with those comments and pass it on to my colleague, Ganpati. Thanks, Arun, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And congratulations on your 50th uh, year celebrations. Um, Axelor itself is a good example of uh, the contextual intelligence that Tarun talked about. I'll come to it shortly. Um, as part of my opening comments, I wanted to share with you my thoughts uh, and learnings from running Axelor, uh, which is a year old. Axelor is a platform to support innovation and entrepreneurship in India. Uh, why are these learnings important? Um, today, India is witnessing a revolution of starts in entrepreneurship. It's the third largest ecosystem for entrepreneurs. Uh, and it has reached that uh, rank in record time. Uh, in Let's Venture, one of the platforms that connects uh, entrepreneurs to investors, there are 18 new startups registering every day. That's about 5,500 startups a year. This tremendous interest, rising awareness, and relative uh, easy access to capital, but the mortality rate is also very high. Uh, so we set up, two of my co-founders are right here, uh, we set up Axelor with the vision to improve the odds of success of entrepreneurs in the first 24 months. Uh, I will share uh, three approaches or learnings uh, from Axelor, and I, I share this in the spirit that I believe these perspectives will apply to any platform supporting entrepreneurship and innovation. First, uh, defining our success uh, in terms of improving the odds of success for entrepreneurs. Whenever you start an entity, there is always a tendency to define uh, the outcomes in terms of what the entity does uh, in terms of activities. But when we looked at it in terms of startups uh, rather than Axelor itself, our approach turned out to be quite different uh, because startups need different kinds of interventions at different points in time of their uh, journey. Um, if I look at startups uh, in terms of uh, three distinct stages from idea to pilot, pilot to launch and launch to scale, 
uh, the need that need for uh, startups to think interventions like mentoring, access to capital, or access to talent, or access to market. These are very different at different points in time. So the first learning was that if we have to be relevant to startups in the first 24 months, the uh, need for programs uh, to be specifically designed to address these three distinct stages of startups. Uh, second uh, thing, and that uh, bears uh, lessons for accelerators in general, is what is the intrinsic value uh, of a platform like Axelor, right? Uh, most accelerators measure their outcomes in terms of uh, their startups going through them, going on to raise their next round of funding, right? But that number is not only small, it's grossly misleading. Uh, we at Axelor are looking at creating the science and intellectual property behind Ax uh, the, the uh, uh, intellectual property of running an accelerator. What does that mean? Uh, the primary value that we see of doing something like this is in being a large repository of failed experiments. Everybody focuses on what makes it successful, but uh, running cohorts of startups going through our programs actually enable Axelor to be the roof under which uh, we have a large repository of failed experiments. And, and the real value is in being able to use the knowledge out of these uh, failed experiments to benefit every succeeding cohort cohort of startups in, in improving their odds of success. Uh, we actually insist that every startup contribute back uh, to, the, to the knowledge base of Axelor in terms of the problems that they have solved, so that every succeeding cohort of startups focus on problems that are core to them and not, don't necessarily waste their time on problems that have already been solved by others, right? Uh, third, uh, a point uh, Tarun briefly alluded to is uh, we are also in some sense a clearing house for ideas, uh, right? And, and we believe that we can actually play a direct role uh, in matching entrepreneurs to big problems uh, that are otherwise not seeking uh, any entrepreneurial interest. There are several areas, uh, at least in India, which are ripe for uh, entrepreneurial disruption, but which don't necessarily uh, attract good entrepreneurial activity or investor interest. A classic example is a healthcare. Is healthcare. So with the right kind of research, it is not very difficult to come up with specific problems, big problems that need to be solved. And doing whatever we are doing allows us to uh, direct entrepreneurial interest and put a spotlight on the big problems so that those problems have a better chance of uh, getting solved. Uh, so those are, those are uh, the three learnings I thought I should share uh, based on whatever we have done till now and what our aspiration is. Uh, so I would just uh, part with a question to uh, Shibu, given that he's in the order and he has already spoken, so that uh, there is no discontinuity as well. Uh, so, um, Infosys existed at a point in time where none of these platforms for supporting entrepreneurship or innovation um, existed. Uh, so what did it take for Infosys to retain the entrepreneurial streak and, uh, and retain the startup energy to go on for almost three and a half decades with that, with that uh, energy and drive? Thanks, Ganapati. Um, single answer is youth. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, you know, this is an organization with an average age of 27 and a half. So 170,000 people. When I left, I think the average age went down. <laughs> so, um, you know, young people are extremely innovative if you let them be innovative. The issue with any organization is that you put down so many constraints. And that happened with Infosys also. I'm not saying it did not happen. Um, so people, um, the, I think in the first 20 years of Infosys, if I remember, people were enormously empowered. They were asked to do one thing, and I think they were fundamentally asked to do one thing. They were asked to do what is right for the clients. The, we were very clear that the people who put, put food on the table are our clients. And Infosys never had thousands of clients. We are not a consumer organization, right? We are a client organization. So um, in 2014, Infosys had 500 clients. Right, 500, right? 2014, how many clients? 2014, 770. 770 clients. So in, uh, in early 2000, that number would be 200, 300. So we, were, we drilled into the people saying that whatever is right for the client, you do. And we empowered them to do it. So that allowed them to be very, very focused on the clients and, and, and pretty innovative. 
sometimes overly innovative but pretty innovative in doing doing things that's number one definitely we en encouraged people taking risks or many of the projects which we used to do were at the at the what i used to call at the fringes we will have no capability to do it it will be a new technology we will boldly go and say we will do it and struggle through it so we encouraged um, our pro project managers the front line was always the project manager or the program manager we encouraged them to take risks and uh, of course if you fail you will get yelled at people will scream at you all kinds of things will happen but that is it you will not be punished much <laughs> you will get all the yelling and screaming and all that will happen but then you know people will say ah it's okay move on next one so i think that is the second one um, the culture of uh, ability to take risk and um, the ability to fail without having um, too much consequence then um, so this happened for the first 20 years but then the organization grew and um, you know what was at stake was too large right so that is when so then we built this um, culture of what we call continuous improvement so we created this um, positive cycle where we will measure everything so we used to say in god we trust rest of you bring data so any conversation you have to bring data so we started measuring everything so error rates um, schedule um, problems all of those things and from the measurement we will do analytics we will figure out what is doing well what is not doing well what is doing well how to do it better what not doing what is not doing well what is the root cause go and fix it go back to measurement so created this um, continuous cycle in fact um, this is one of the criteria in cmm level 5 that you have to have this continuous cycle that's how it started out but to lot extent we institutionalized it so this whole philosophy of measurements um, analytics root cause correction measurement and that also allowed us to be pretty much objective otherwise it is all he said she said you know so we used to do customer satisfaction surveys we used to do project uh, sorry program closure surveys we used to do employee survey employee satisfaction surveys we used to do uh, all of these data points used to add up um, to uh, create a continuous cycle of improvement so in the initial stages it was all about um, empowerment it was all about risk taking it is all about tolerance to failure as the organization grew larger lot of it went into this uh, continuous improvement process thank you thank you shivan good day thank you and thank you. congratulations to met college right. it's um, a great pleasure to be with this esteemed group of panelists Uh, 15 years ago, when I was at Stanford College of Engineering, I called my mom and told her I had picked my PhD dissertation topic. And I said, I'm going to study open source. And she said, that sounds really gross. <laughs> Aren't they doing that at the medical school? <laughs> Why are they doing that in engineering? I said, "Oh no, 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 this is a new model. It's a new type of software development, not open source. That's that's something else." Um so you all know what open source is and um I uh I was really eager to learn about it because I was sort of fascinated. How do people actually produce software? What are the most interdependent, complex things in the world without leaders? Hard, right? without managers uh without structure without an organization and i have been really over, remarkably impressed over the last 15 years with how robust the community form is and i continue to be surprised i keep thinking these communities will fail and they're keep coming more and more and more um and i'm going to go through a couple of examples but One of the things when I say community, um communities can exist inside firms, they can exist um as part of corporations or complementary to them, but usually there's a few features that mark a community. There's um more lateral and horizontal coordination. 
people are there because they want to be. So there's a self-selection of tasks. People um, are usually mutually interdependent and in working toward a common goal. What I see now, 15 years later, since I wrote my dissertation about open source, <laughs> is an abundance of communities. And they're all doing different things in the innovation process. And I'll go through a couple that I know about, and maybe you know some as well. I also see that if you're an entrepreneur today, and this is probably true for the Axelor Network, there's probably a community out there that can help you with at least one or more aspects of your business, whether it's brainstorming, ideation, concept development, funding, marketing. There's a community out there that can help you. So for example, there are communities that just help with the front end of innovation, which is solving a particular problem conceptually, coming up with new ideas. Um, Netflix was well, well regarded for posting their algorithm matching contest, awarding a million dollars to the best team who could improve their algorithm for matching movies by 10%. Incentive has new problems every day with an award open uh, that anybody can try to solve. Um, and my colleague, my co-author Kareem Lakani is at HBS with Tarun. He found that the people who are most likely to solve problems are one or two steps away. Patients like me is identifying new drugs and new applications for existing drugs to solve patients with incurable diseases. And that community is growing rapidly. Open IDEO is really focused on social problems. And they are bringing in people every day, very focused, very time focused. What is your best idea for how to solve a problem like malaria or um, fitness or child abuse? These are big problems. Now then there's a whole bunch of communities that go further. They actually take those ideas and want to do concept design development. And you can be an artist, you can be a creator. Um, you can fund and develop and produce your own idea. And then there's communities that do sourcing. Um, Kickstarter and Celeban are two that have been researched by scholars. But I went to a crowdsourcing website in preparing for this panel. and. Uh, crowdsourcing.org has like 2,000 <laughs> sites that either do crowd work or crowd financing. So this is a really high growth area. And then in the middle band, there's lots of communities that are doing creative production. And here's where you see more organic communities where people are founded and managed according to their own self-interest, whether it's Linux or Apache, which I've studied, or Mozilla. Top Coder is more of contest-based. And then you've got a whole range of cultural production here. And then communities also come in at the end of the innovation process. They help a lot of companies with feedback. They help refine product ideas. They help market product ideas. Starbucks has this community about, you know, what are your ideas? What would you like to see? They're polling the people who come in there, and people are suggesting ideas. Facebook is being used more for marketing than it is for social. And then um, people who, in the final bucket here, market adoption and dissemination, sort of at the end, people are giving reviews of, of things. Active reviewers on Amazon, uh, Yelp, TripAdvisor, to name a few. How many of you spend an hour or more a day in one of these communities on this slide? OK, not very many. So the interesting thing is, and I think where scholars need to go next, is figuring out what types of communities of work better at the front of the innovation process versus the end. Um, one of the things I'm noticing that at the, in the ideation stage, you have communities who are being motivated by prizes or contests. Maybe those, those are problems initiated by companies. And communities can help solve a company problem. In the middle, these are problems that communities care about, less corporate, they're less commercial. And then at the end, we see a lot more commercial ideas, which are helping to refine or disseminate or work on products that already exist. So I think it's kind of interesting to see how the motivation, interests, and rewards of these different communities vary across the stage in the innovation cycle. And I don't have any answers. I think we have a lot of scholars who've done research on one or two of the communities on the slide, myself included. And I don't see that we've built any frameworks or models that kind of work across a large, 
a large end data set of what these communities look like, how they're structured, how they're motivated, whether there's rewards, whether the problems are defined by the people who enter and engage there, or whether they're defined by the, the companies who post them. Um, so I guess the question I post is, you know, how are you using communities to solve your innovation problems, um, and how are they affecting your business models? And I think this is a good lead-in for Chris, who's going to talk more about platforms. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. Uh, while they're getting my slides ready, let me add my congratulations to Met College for its first 50 years, and also wish it another 50 or 150 years that will require every bit of entrepreneurship savvy, <laughs> because as I'm going to suggest, uh, all industries and higher education as well are, are entering a phase of uh, pretty rapid and radical change. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, uh, most people think about new products and new services. Uh, however, the internet has enabled a new form of entrepreneurship which is based on business model innovation. So if we take a look at some of the most successful or companies that are on, you know, on the news a lot these days, we'll see something interesting. So Uber is the world's largest taxi company today, but it owns no taxis. Okay. So Facebook, it's arguably the world's largest media company in terms of you know, content produced and consumed, but it itself produces no content. Alibaba, how many people know Alibaba? Okay, that's a Chinese eBay, which is actually even larger than eBay. It's the world's most valuable retailer and owns no inventory. And Airbnb, how many people have used Airbnb or are hosting rooms through Airbnb? All right, yeah, it's the world's larger hotelier, but owns no real estate. So what are these companies, right, and why are they so successful? They are examples of what uh, it's increasingly called the platform business model. It's another use of this overused term called platform, right? Mm -hmm. So what are platforms? So platforms are harnessing the, the part of the internet and social technologies in order to connect two or more groups of people together, right? They don't buy or sell anything, but primarily they form connections between two or more groups through which those groups can meet one another and potentially transact. And they're adding value to both sides, and then they can potentially charge both sides. So for example, eBay or Alibaba, right? They're not a retailer, but they're a broker, right? They bring buyers and sellers together, and so does Uber or Airbnb, okay? So the beauty of the platform model is that um, there is no need for expensive physical assets, such as inventory. There's no need for a huge staff of software engineers, right, uh, or service providers more in general. As a result, the profit margins of successful platform companies are usually much higher than those of the more conventional counterparts. I used to teach a case uh, about Amazon, and you know, in the back of the Harvard case, there was a chart with their profit margins, and you know, Amazon at best makes three to four percent, right? Then you look at the eBay case, and the corresponding profit margins are like you know, twelve to fifteen percent, right? There's no, there's, there's no, uh, there's no. Uh, it's, it's not strange that Amazon is actually moving very fast to becoming a platform company because, as perhaps you know, increasingly now it serves as a, as a e-commerce storefront for third-party retailers. It's a much better business model. Mm -hmm. Also, not being tied down to the physical limitations, platforms can scale very quickly. Okay? In fact, most platforms exhi exhibit a property which is called network effects, meaning that the more people are on the platform, the more attractive the platform is for new people to jump on board. Think again about eBay, right? The more sellers are on the market, the more attractive it is for buyers. And the more buyers are there, the more sellers are going to join eBay. <coughs> so as a result of this property called network effects, uh, in a lot of platform markets, we tend to have winner-take-all outcomes, meaning that the market is dominated by uh, one big player. Let me just show you my second slide, right? So, so in this slide, I'll just show you two, uh, let's say, pie charts. So the, the pie chart on the left shows you the market share of the automotive industry, which is a more traditional brick-and-mortar industry. And you can see the market leader has about 15% of the market. Okay, the, mar the, the, the pie chart to the right shows you the market share. It's actually a little old. Now it's a little different. But uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the market share of, of uh, microcomputer operating systems. 
Okay, so operating systems can also be thought of as platforms because they connect users and application developers, right? Okay, so the Windows has 90% of the market. Okay, and this is typical. In most platform markets, you see this type of uh, situation when things basically uh, become mature enough. So, as you see, um, for all of those reasons, entrepreneurship in the platform area has some different properties from launching a traditional product or services company. Um, success is based on building the right environment for a community to develop, right? Because innovation doesn't happen within the boundaries of the organization, it happens outside, right? I mean, a platform is successful, the more the one on the other side are come and the, the more I, and, and, and the more good ideas they bring to the table, right? So, so you have to think differently about uh, launching such a business, right? Also, because of the potential for winner take all outcomes, competition tends to be very fierce, and pricing is very interesting. It's not uncommon in platform businesses to actually subsidize the one side of the market in order to for it to build scale, and then you charge only the other. Like for example, Facebook arguably is offering a lot of services for free, right? I mean, think of all the things you can do on Facebook and you pay nothing. Why? Because, well, it's, it wants to build this huge user base and then it wants to deliver it to advertisers, okay? So that's just one example of, of that. Um, the other thing that's very interesting with platforms is um, <coughs> the implications of this new model for the more traditional product and service-based companies. Uh, again, let me use Facebook as an example. Assuming that Facebook has emerged as the world's largest entry point for media companies, right? So people now do not no longer go to the New York Times homepage to read the news. They go on Facebook, right? And they read the news that their friends are sharing with them. What are the implications for the New York Times, right? Uh, and ditto, you know, if Airbnb emerges as the world's largest entry point for looking for hotel rooms, what does this mean for Hilton and Marriott, right? In fact, universities have to be thinking as well about this phenomenon, right? And particularly places like the Met College, which uh, do a lot of continuing and online education. Um, some of the best known platforms in the space of higher education now are MOOC platforms like Coursera and edX. Now Coursera and edX, they basically carry content which is developed by universities such as BU. We are members of edX as you may know. But what's happening is that increasingly students go to let's say Coursera and they take a course which is <coughs> produced by Stanford University, bless you. And then at the end of the course, if they're happy, they tweet, thank you, Coursera. They don't, they don't tweet, thank you, Stanford. Right? So as you think, things are shifting, and we have to be thinking very, very hard about mm. what this means, both for starting new businesses, where the platform model is a very attractive for a lot of startups, but also what is this new way of thinking about uh, uh, business think for existing players, including universities. Thank you, Chris. Um, and with this, um, the floor is open for questions. These are immensely complex issues, so, um, and we got really a whirlwind of uh, ideas right here. Well, I'll start with a question. I'm sitting here and listening, and I have a, I feel some, and all of it is true when I listen to it. But there is, I think, I feel some disconnect. Let me, and, and it's, um, I, I, I'm not sure I can articulate the disconnect. That, that would be a miracle if I could. But uh, <laughs> to give uh, it, it, where, the examples where it comes from. So I I'm come from Eastern Europe, from um, and the socialist economy from the socialist economy, which collapsed, and it collapsed, and then it couldn't, which was I mean, it was the right thing. It was the uh, an untenable, uh, uh, irrational model, economic model. But the prescription then uh, that were offered from 
leading Western and uh, US universities um, actually contributed to the collapse of the economy, which was not necessarily needed and could have been avoided. And that happened not just in the Eastern countries, it happened even in East Germany uh, that was reunited with West Germany. So it was, uh, uh, that's a global example of what Tarun said, well, best practices do not travel. They were very well-intentioned, good, pra uh, good practices, uh, and it was a dismal, a dismal implementation in part because uh, the countries both wholesale the ideas of the, the best things of the West and did not adapt and did not think of context. So um, that makes a lot of sense. It's heartening to know that in India, it worked exactly the other way. Actually, that change in markets, um, in currencies um, helped India. And uh, it was, it, it's, um, it's really very optimistic to see this example. Um, now, that is the 90s. We get to today and we have community and platform and that, I don't know, I mean, it, on one side it looks like there, is, there are a lot of ideas coming into the communities, but I'm, I'm thinking, I'm asking myself how many of these ideas really help the business or are taken on by the business as opposed to create visibility and uh, secondary marketing for the business. Um, that would be very interesting uh, uh, to, to look at because the businesses themselves, many of them from what I, I read in the literature, uh, I mean in the mass media, they are still operated very much centrally and some of them actually are more autocratic than the other industries. So can you comment of where we are going <laughs> with this? very divergent uh, uh, direction, actually. And, and similar, did the platform companies are, are yeah. uh, in the same vein? Well, I, I, there, I mean, it, I think if you're directing that to me. Oh, to everybody. Oh, okay. It's um, was, I think it's white enough for everybody to uh, jump in. Sure, <laughs> sure. Well, let me defer. Then go ahead. Um, I, 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 there are a lot of very mature firms that are kind of playing with the idea of community or experimenting with the idea of community. So Cisco will have a big brainstorm. What's our next big business idea? That's open to the world. Anybody can join. IBM is running these jams and they're open. They're open platforms. So you get a lot of diversity of ideas. Now, there's a funnel by which those ideas will be narrowed down and one or two may get play inside the organization. And then once those ideas live inside the organization, they're managed hierarchically mm. the way they always were. That's kind of what I'm saying. Corporations are playing at the very beginning, at the very end. The real collective creation is kind of in the middle. And I yeah, think you're, ex you're exactly right. And th then, okay, community, great job. We're gonna go give this to our product development team. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and so those yeah. models are coexisting rather than say, replacing. Thank you. I, I can attempt a synthetic response in some ways. So, I mean, I think the way I, I try to stitch these comments <laughs> together is that um, the platforms and communities that we're talking about are a mechanism to generate ideas. And when we're sitting in Bangalore in, our, in one version of our lives trying to think of how do we come up with solutions for these problems that, again, at a very abstract level are very generic, you know, how do we have uncontaminated food? How do we make sure that everybody can turn the lights on? Uh, very generic problems that everybody has, um, but ha that have to be solved very differently. Uh, you know, we at the incubator, which is nothing but a platform, uh, can open it up to the community and say, come and brainstorm ideas with us so that we make sure we don't get stuck only restricting ourselves to whatever idea has worked somewhere else and that we might inappropriately transport into our environment such as happened in the shock therapy in Eastern Europe, yeah. which didn't work. So 
I think it just requires an orientation to be open to ideas and to use different mechanisms to bring the ideas in. So that, that's the way at least I'm stitching them together. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I could continue, but uh, <laughs> um, any questions, comments? I, I was a little surprised by the, uh, the data showing very little transfer be between yeah. countries. Um, that's, that's a macro thing. Yeah. What about be between Boston and uh, <laughs> New California? York. Yeah. What, what about East Boston and South Boston? What, yeah. Does, does, does that number get better as, as you get closer geographically or, 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 or culturally? So, you know, just as a uh, preface to that, there, there is a branch of economics that had looked at things like this for 30 years, and one of my advisors at Harvard was one of the originators of those exercises. And uh, they had always found very tight correlation between um, you know, success factors and rankings of how good a particular setting is. But they always looked at places where the data were easily available. So they always looked at Canada, the UK, the United States, uh, Australia. Um, so that's sort of like looking for the ring under the lamppost because the light's there. And the, you may have lost the ring somewhere else, but <laughs> you look under the lamppost, the light's there. So that was sort of a very, so the re, when we, re, uh, this is a work that I did with a colleague at Harvard. When we looked at it, it was the first time that you had data on 100 countries for 25 years, tens of thousands of entities over multiple months and quarters. So it's not quite what we call big data, but it's biggish data, right? Certainly a lot bigger than what it used to be. And the answer there, I'm sorry to say, is zero. <laughs> you can shake it any way you want, but it's zero. And again, it's not that unintuitive. It's not so, uh, I'll just repeat the same example. If you say that, you know, we want to all work for companies that have good values. Right? So Shibu said that, you know, the value of values. How can you disagree with that? Of course we all want to work with it. But, and at some level, even one level of abstraction below, it would still be transferable. We don't, we want to work for companies that don't tell lies, that, you know, treat people ethically and so on. But then when you peel it down even further, uh, what constitutes good behavior in one situation may not quite be the same somewhere else. So I think it's, it depends on the level of specificity mm. at which you're asking, does it transfer? If it's very abstract in general, like motherhood and apple pie, yeah, that transfers. But does it transfer from Boston to California? I don't know, we don't have the data. I don't have the data for that, yeah. What would you think? Uh, much more than... Uh, uh, much more than between countries. But by the way, when you restrict our data to countries that seem a lot more comfortable to you, uh, close enough, cognitively close enough, it's not quite zero, but it's still pretty close to zero, <laughs> yes. So but anybody who wants this, I have like an 80-page you know, statistical paper I'm happy to ship to you, so. Um, anyway. There is a is question over there. Could you speak up? Okay. Um, on the first question of uh, how do we actually um, transfer this, uh, right, the, the value of failed experiments to different groups, um, there are different ways to do it, but, but an institutional way to do it would, uh, as I said, uh, we actually uh, very closely track 
uh, what kind of goals that people carry and what has been the outcome for this goal. So, for instance, in our accelerator program, which is a 100-day program, uh, the startups that come in and the second cohort is uh, likely to come in this uh, 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 week after next. Uh, so we actually track how uh, how these weekly pro, uh, weekly goals uh, uh, you know what has been the progress on these weekly goals and what kind of things work well and try to correlate it with what kind of teams are working on this right and if there is a, and our our attempt is to capture this in a systemic way so that the third cohort when it comes if it is working on a similar problem right. Uh, would possibly not go through the same route and spend about two weeks to figure out what doesn't work, uh, right? And uh, it it may or may not work for them, but the, at least they have the uh, knowledge coming out of similar kind of uh, uh, goals or similar kind of initiatives run by startups and previous cohorts. So that's 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 how we are trying to do it. And over a period of time, uh, we are sure that there will be a taxonomy of problems. Right. Once we run uh, several of these cohorts, so that should be made available, uh, you know, definitely to our startups. But if it is if it is reasonably validated, there is no reason why it should not be made available to startups outside of Axlor as well. So, can I just ask? That's such a great source of data. I hope you're working with a good doctoral student to in, to use this as research. Uh, we could always do with more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, I think in the first, uh, uh, you know, first phase of moving from idea to pilot, the most important question to answer is whether you're working on something that somebody actually wants and is willing to pay. Uh, so, so having the discipline around uh, market validation and and validating whether it is something that uh, people actually want, I think that's the biggest uh, discipline to build. When it goes from uh, pilot to launch, I think uh, you'll have to focus more on technology as well as operations. When it goes from launch to scale, uh, you have to focus on the team uh, to take it forward and the uh, uh, replicability of the business model. Thank you very much. We are out of time. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the audience for coming. And most importantly, actually, thank you for, uh, to our panelists.